Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. Today, we're talking about twins and multiples. If you know someone who is pregnant with twins or multiples, or just recently had twins or multiples over the past year, stop right now and share this episode with them immediately. My guest today is originally from Johannesburg, South Africa. She has extensive training and experience in child development and preschool administration. She has been an acclaimed teacher at Baby's First Class since 2003 and is best known for her Twins and Multiples classes. She was mentored by Baby's First Class owner and founder Jackie Rosenberg and has worked closely with her to develop a dedicated Twins and Multiples adaptation of the Baby's First Class curriculum. She's the mother of six children, including a set of identical twin girls. Sue Darrison, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You're the guru. <laughs> That's what they say. I mean, everybody in, in – we're in Los Angeles. Everybody – within miles of here who has multiples seeks you out and takes your classes and you save their lives. Well, I try to. I also try and add that little bit of humor and remind them that it's actually all fantastic. Oh, good. Yeah. That's important for anybody having children. Exactly. And I think that's what happens is that it's so overwhelming, the 24-hour surround sound that you have when you have multiples, Yeah. that you forget to actually take a step back and think, oh my gosh, what a blessing. You've got this inst instant ginormous family, and you're so lucky. Yeah, it's at least stereo and sometimes actual oh. surround sound. Remember, you don't get that break. There is never <laughs> no that break. off button. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I read a quote somewhere that said there's, there's two things that life could never fully prepare you for, uh, twins. And <laughs> so it's probably even more so with uh, triplets and quads and, and so on. Right. I feel, though that often when you are parent of multiples, your first children, ignorance is bliss. Oh, really? <laughs> so I feel like when you've given it, you've already had a singleton and then you're given multiples, you're like, oh, my goodness. Uh -huh. The parents that actually are brave enough to have a child after the multiples, <laughs> yeah. they're like, oh, my goodness, I can take one baby, put it in my purse and leave the house. <laughs> and there's like, this is really easy. Well, you did both. You had singletons, then twins. Right. Two and then... singletons, multiples, two singletons. Right. Yeah. Did you start getting interested in twins and multiples before yours, or is that what really threw you into it? That triggered it. That, that was when I decided, okay, let's see what I could do, started off very slow um, and thought, okay, let's see, I can start doing some studies on it, seeing what's going on out there, talking to everybody. I met with a few different professionals out there, spoke about the multiple world. And then we were noticing that at Jackie Rosenberg's classes that more and more people were coming with multiples and couldn't relate to the people that had one child. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, let me try and take this curriculum. It took me three years to write my curriculum because I really wanted to gear it to multiples. Plus you had a bunch of kids running around. Exactly. <laughs> I had four children in 28 months. Wow. Because I had a one, 14 months later, another one, and 14 months later we were blessed with identical Two girls. More. Wow. But I'm going to tell you the best thing about my identical girls is that they are both mothers now. And they each have a baby, and they the babies are one. Being that my girls are identical, so their DNA being the way it is, my grandchildren are actually not considered half not considered first cousins, but half siblings to each other. To each other. You mean your grandchildren from your each of your daughters are considered half siblings to each other? Exactly, not first cousins. Oh wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I did not know that because of the DNA and being that they're one sac, one, the mono, that's the yeah. 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 So uh, is that something that runs in families? So no. That's Identical the one that's, twins do not run in that's families. That's just a total surprise. That's when an egg splits. Yeah. A fraternal is when it you, typically runs in families. What was that like for you when you found out you there was not one but two? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> remember I had an eight-month-old at home, so it was like, oh, my goodness, I just was not feeling well. It was definitely a big shock because all of a sudden your house is going to a big house, and you're like, oh, my gosh, my little sedan car is not going <laughs> to fit gonna be four enough. car seats. Yeah. And so you go all of a sudden to, like, this huge, overwhelming family. Hmm. But what a blessing. Yeah. I, I have uh, 
I've done a couple of interviews for, with people about the moment they found out they were having twins, and um, it's always so shocking. Uh, oh, yes. The the two that I interviewed recently already had one and then got pregnant with twins afterwards. And, uh, yeah, I actually have a little <laughs> snippet. We'll put it on, on the website, informedpregnancy.com. Um, what, before we move too far into it, what is baby's first class for people who don't know? So it is an interactive parenting class that meets in Sherman Oaks, California. And we have, we meet once a week for one hour and we group our classes according to baby's ages. So in the multiples classes, we mix three months together. So January, February, and March, or April, May, or June, something like that. In the singleton classes, when you have one, you just we group those just per month. Mm-hmm. In a singleton class, we start off with 19 babies and 19 parents. Okay. In a multiple class, I like to top it maximum at at nine or 10 parents with 20 babies. Wow. And I will say, I shouldn't say it's just 20 because very often I do have triplets and quads that do come as well, but very- Still with one parent? One parent, amazing, amazing parents. I will say my moms that have more than two and dads are the most accomplished, relaxed, with it people you'll ever imagine. Really. Yeah, I think that they just have like realized that the numbers have just outnumbered them and we might as well just enjoy the ride. What kind of things do you do every week? So my curriculum starts off with obviously the most important thing and I start the babies off at three months. I start off with trying to get them onto a schedule. The most important thing, how to sleep through the night, Mm -hmm. which is everybody wants to learn how to do. How do you get multiples to sleep through the night? How soon can you get them to do it? What is the trick? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I go from there. The new big thing is obviously tummy time because we have back sleepers, how to get our babies stronger in their cause, how to get them exercising. I talk about language. I talk about introducing a second language, how the brain is such a sponge and when to do it. I talk about separation anxiety, security objects, what is it like to be a multiple? What are multiples like? I go into this whole weekend that that we have once a year, they have a whole convention for twins um, in Twinsville. And all they do is discuss all the hot topics about multiples. Mm. And needless to say, the hottest topic every single year, without a doubt, is should we dress our children alike? <laughs> <laughs> should we put them in the same school, same class? So typical things as young children always come up. Um, and then I take the babies from three months and we graduate them around 16 to 18 months. And I go right up to the bigger things. I go through nursery schools, how to pick a nursery school. What about putting them into the same classes? I talk about food, one having one being a picky eater, one not being a picky eater, one wanting just to nurse, one wanting to bottle feed. How do you drop the guilt? when one is a leader, when one is not, when one does all the speaking for the other, the other one's shy, how not to label them. I go into toilet training that Mm. these children are two different little people and doesn't mean that they will train at the same time, doesn't mean they will walk at the same time, doesn't mean that they will learn to crawl at the same time. And how do you not do your comparisons, which is probably one of the harder things when you have two little bodies running next to each other, not to do that comparison. When, um, out of curiosity, when you have identical twins, are they more likely to do things at the same time than fraternal twins? They are, but remember, a lot of it is, um, we, we always judge a lot of their development being large motor skill, gross motor skills, and that really is when the brain can click into that action. Mm-hmm. So learning how to walk, learning how to crawl, learning how to sit up. So it's not really such a thing because they're identical, their brains are working the same way. Mm-hmm. It's really a manual ability. Mm-hmm. So it goes it's a little individual. quicker. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start at the beginning with, um, if we can, go through each stage and just some practical tips uh, most of our listeners are pregnant, so probably a lot of 
people who are expecting twins are going to listen to this. And a lot of our listeners recently had a baby. So maybe before the break, we can talk about more about pregnancy through the various trimesters and, um, and childbirth and getting the house ready. And then afterwards, come back and talk a little bit more about now that you're bringing home twins, how do you survive that? Um, during pregnancy, a twin pregnancy, things are different than in a singleton pregnancy. <laughs> right. I mean, the most obvious thing is is you have the, the bigger weight gain and the, the faster growth. Um, how is twin pregnancy for you compared to singleton pregnancy? Well, don't judge me because I was very blessed, and I know people don't like to hear that. But I was very blessed. I carried them. I was put on bed rest at around 22 weeks just because it looked like my cervix was shortening. Um, but I carried them. I got up the day of 36 weeks on the day. I got up. I remember walking around the block, came home, and I was in full labor. Oh, wow. And had them a couple hours later. And I was blessed to have them naturally as well. So n- not really fair to judge me. I feel that right now, most important thing is you need to listen to your doctors. Mm-hmm. And I think when they tell you, make sure every day you lie down, you put your feet up, you're drinking your fluids. We know that pregnant women dehydrate way quicker than uh, normal people. And they don't listen always to their bodies. So they need to be listening to their bodies when they have those aches and pains, when they're that uncomfortable. Listen to what your body's telling you. Go home, lie down, make sure you're eating that really nutritious diet. It's not eating for three. That is not. (laughs) That's me. I'm eating for three. (laughs) But it is eating well. That's the important thing. Eat well, feel good if you've exercised. Speak to your doctor. See if they'll want you to continue exercising. Don't listen to every single story out there that tells you you're going to have them early, tells them that you have to have a C-section, tells them that you're going to have preemies. Listen to what your body is telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think once you know that you're pregnant with twins, it's important to find a provider who you feel comfortable with. Um, and who is comfortable with twins, uh, you know, how they handle delivery of twins really varies greatly from... Absolutely. uh, I know midwives and doctors who deliver twins at home completely naturally, and I know that there's a number of doctors that will automatically do cesarean just... So that whole idea of the automatic cesarean is really and truthfully slowing down slightly Mm -hmm. because they're seeing that a lot of women are wanting to try the natural. I think that where it's jumping up the cesarean is where they see that there's no way baby B would be able to come down into Mm -hmm. the birth canal or baby B is transverse or something like that. And so that's why they decide, okay, it'll have to be C. They don't want to do one of each. They don't want to do one of each. And probably most people wouldn't want to receive one of each. Um, But then again, even though most doctors don't deliver breech babies vaginally today, more doctors are comfortable doing after coming twins yes. if the baby B is breached. So if baby A yeah, is Yeah, because bigger, already your cervix is open, so it's not as difficult right. then to if you have a if you have somebody that's well trained exactly. in doing that. Somebody who's well trained and then the risk with vaginal delivery of a breech baby, the primary risk is that the baby will get stuck on the way out. So exactly. if the baby A is head down and is the same size or even a little bigger than baby B. Baby B being breached is not as concerning Correct. because the door's already open. If baby A didn't right. get stuck, baby as B should As long get stuck. as your cervix doesn't start to close after the first one, yeah. which it definitely has once you're contracting. Sometimes your contractions after baby A has been delivered do slow down. Mm-hmm. And then things, the door can start to close. Exactly. Itself, not, yeah. But listen, these doctors, midwives, anybody that is doing that now, are anticipating that. Mm -hmm. They know what those risks are, and they're watching to make sure that they keep the cervix open. They're not waiting for a two- to three-hour gap between the children. Right. And common practice around here is even if if you're delivering twins at the hospital, they like to do it in the OR. So the reason they do it in the OR is, depending on how the delivery goes, that you need two full sets two full teams. Mm. So you have a full neonatal team to take care of 
baby A as well as baby B? And then what happens if an emergency C-section does need to get performed? Mm -hmm. And remember, it's slightly larger being that they're going to pull out two or three babies. Right. So that's why you do it in an OR room. Well, that's interesting that there's a team for each baby. Absolutely. So if you're having quads. A full warming tray. Yes. There's a lot of people in there. Yeah. No, this I'll just tell you a little story. When I was delivering my multiples, I remember I was at a hospital, a local hospital here, and a resident knocked on the door. And he said, I've never seen a vaginal twin delivery. Would you mind if I came and watched? And I'm like, well, there's 22 people here. <laughs> What's 23? 23 is not going to be a problem. <laughs> you know, it's funny about that. I was, I was recently at a vaginal breech birth at a local hospital here. There's a doctor who still does them pretty regularly, actually. And um, they, he said the same thing to her. He's like, do you, because we don't do these very often and we have residents. I really like for the residents to learn, but also the nurses like to get comfortable with it. Do you mind if there's some extra people in the room? And she said, no, she didn't mind. Partially, I think she wanted to share the experience so more people can learn and then Absolutely. more people can have the option down the road. But also she said, I'm blind as a bat without my glasses, so <clears throat> I'll just take them off and not know who's there. <laughs> And we got there, she was she hadn't progressed that much, and then all of a sudden she was progressing very quickly. And I wasn't I was there as a, a doula and I was working with her and I wasn't concentrating on who was in the room. It was really just her husband and a friend and the nurse. Um, and things were picking up really fast. So we were all very focused on helping her stay calm and relaxed. And she was doing amazing. She didn't really need very much. But then at some point after the doctor came in, I turned around and there were literally 25 people in the room. And it was, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. And I was, I was startled by how many people were in the room. They're all quiet and respectful. But you start to look at the the uniforms and you try to figure out like that's labor and delivery nurses, those are residents, there's a pediatric person, there's like two helpful Honda guys, I think, in there. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was like a little of everything. That's it. And Perfect I think, learning experience. Cafeteria really. girl. Yeah. But it's it's nice when you share that experience because then more people can get comfortable with providing that right. that service. Um, in term, are there other things that you recommend for pregnancy or in preparation for birth of multiples? Well, things to have at the hospital, is that different than... Well, the truth is, I think that what they're recommending, a lot of the doctors do right now really like the slow down, bed rest kind of idea. Not they And please ask your doctors mm -hmm. when they tell you to slow down, what does that mean? Does that mean I need to lie down from 6 a.m. in the morning and only go to the restroom? Mm -hmm. Does that mean I can walk around the house, just not go for long walks? What does it mean when you're on bed rest? Mm -hmm. They like you to try and take it easy because the longer we can keep the babies inside, the bigger they'll be, mm -hmm. the easier they are to take home too. The other thing, to take home preemies, if they both go to the NICU and then one gets released, oh, that's really very hard emotionally. Remember, parents, moms, uh, their whole hormonal imbalance is out of control. You're leaving one baby in the hospital and you're taking one baby home. Mm -hmm. So we really try and get those babies to cook a little longer. Yeah. Sometimes it's out of our hands. but So I see a lot. The recommendation is just to not necessarily bed rest, but to like stop so, some of your extra activity and make sure you get extra rest. Absolutely. Put your um, feet up, mm -hmm. eat well, lie on your side. Those are all things I love to do. Perfect. So <laughs> I can have twins <laughs> or trips. Uh, are there extra things to have in advance before the babies arrive that's different? Like I would I, – people always ask me, and I only have experience with one at a time for our four kids, uh, what are the most important things to have in the house or things that we need to bring to the hospital with us? And there's really not that much that's there's important There's nothing to have. because of this wonderful world called Amazon Prime. Especially now, yeah. Exactly. So there's not – the only thing you're going to need when you – hopefully bring them home is you're going to need a car seat for each baby mm -hmm. that would be the most important thing and that's something the other thing is when you bring your babies home now you are not allowed to leave the hospital until you've done a car seat check so the nurse brings the baby out and you have to show them how you put the baby car seat in oh, and take it out which is wonderful that they do that for safety the other thing is the outfit 
Remember, when you bring your babies home, don't bring them in a kissy kissy gown, which is a long robe at the bottom, because their little car seat belt needs to go through their legs. Oh, it won't snap. Exactly. So that they will give you a hat in the hospital, take that home, because their little heads are very small in the beginning. And then when you get home, the most important thing are your newborn diapers, because everybody buys number one, and you want the newborn because of the little cutout size. for the umbilical cord as oh, well. Yeah. So you want the newborn size, but then everything else you get in a day. You mm-hmm. get the same day. Don't overbuy. Mm-hmm. If you get preemies, if you have preemies, you don't want to have a lot of newborn stuff. You might jump over that stage in a blink. Don't buy too much. Um, The one part that's interesting is that they're so big, you've got to come home with your car seat and everything. One thing they don't talk about is the fan and the huge studies that have been done about moving air in a room and the reduction of SIDS. Really? Huge. And as much as they all talk, you have to have your car seat, have to have your car seat, very few of the peds or the specialists are talking, make sure you put a fan. It can be a little $10 fan. In the nursery? In the nursery. It needs to move air. All the, the time. statistics, Just... 78% less reduction of SIDS occurring when there's a fan in the room. Wow. That statistic is huge. That's enormous. Exactly. I've never heard that. There we go. And nobody talks about it. It's a pearl of wisdom for me today. There we go. So I'd like people to say, buy that little fan. One fan for the room. So a fan and two car seats. That's it. And then you'll (laughs) you'll have to decide on your sleeping arrangements. Uh Are you going to want to co-sleep them? Are you going to want to sleep them in two separate bassinets? Are you going to buy the twin pack and play, which I don't recommend for Ooh. multiples. It's very, very short-lived. I'll tell you what. Let's We're, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll start with gear like, Perfect. Uh, and, and sleeping and things like that. But before we do, I have a quick question. I'm, I don't think you know this about me, but I'm face blind. I have no facial recognition. Um, so I can't even pick my kids out of a lineup. I can't pick my own face out of a lineup. I have no face recognition at all. Um, I'm so it makes me very curious when you have identical twin girl babies, like all babies look pretty much the same to me. Nail polish. Uh, oh, so you do have a hard time telling them apart at first. Oh, yes. Your own two kids. Oh, yes. Are you so maybe you have them mixed up? <laughs> <laughs> so one of them was slightly smaller, she was born at four five, the other one was born at four fifteen. Um, and so that makes a little bit of a difference. Okay. So that was one way to tell them part. That was just, and then we, I definitely did nail polish on one, one hundred percent. And I remember as soon as I could, one got a pink bracelet, one got a blue bracelet, for sure. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, yes. good. So, so people who have identical twins know what I feel like in real life. A hundred percent. Fabulous. Okay. We're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back with Sue Darris. And you can use this opportunity to hit the share button and share this episode with somebody who has or is about to have twins or multiples. <laughs> Lots of our pregnant patients say that they hope to breastfeed if it works. Breastfeeding is natural, but it can take some time to learn. To make it easier, I recommend learning breastfeeding basics during your pregnancy. Over 90% of new mothers report having at least one breastfeeding problem during the first few days of their baby's life. Most of these problems could have been avoided if the families had known the basics of breastfeeding and newborn care. Now there is an online course that will teach you the basics of breastfeeding and take you step-by-step through what you need to know. Learn from two registered nurses who are also international board-certified lactation consultants. They've helped over 20,000 new families get started with breastfeeding, and they want to help you too. The course includes 12 video modules done at your own pace, as well as downloadable guides and a community forum. Try it now with a no-risk guarantee. If you're not satisfied, all you have to do is write within the first 30 days to get a full refund. Check out this essential breastfeeding course right now by visiting informedpregnancy.com slash workshops and clicking on Simply Breastfeeding. Visit informedpregnancy.com slash workshops and click on Simply Breastfeeding. (laughs) 
Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and we're continuing our informative conversation about twins and multiples with resident expert, Sue Darrison. All right, before the break, we started to talk a little bit about gear. Um, where do we start? When you, I mean, I thought it was overwhelming to look at all the different categories of gear for one baby, and uh, a book that I felt was very helpful was the Consumer Reports Baby Gear Guide. Um, if for nothing else, it just went through every category saying this is what this category of gear is and who might need it or not need it. And then if you're going to buy something like this, which features to look for or not look for. And then it actually had ratings on each of the different options. I would options. tell you to do that again. Do it again. 100% sign up for Consumer Reports. It's the greatest way to know which product is the safest out there and which one is the best rated. And usually it doesn't mean because it costs the most money, it is the best. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So when I did it with, with one baby, I felt overwhelmed. And the decisions that you have to make, I think, for twins are, are probably more complicated. So where do you start? So the beginning would be, after you've chosen your car seat, is I would presume you would purchase with the two car seat a double snap and go, that you place the baby car seats in. Mm -hmm. So whichever one they're compatible with is what you would buy. Usually side by side is the way they go or back to front. That would be the most important. We're not going to be purchasing the stroller right away besides the double snap and oh, go. Oh, so you have the snap and go and you just put the car seats in exactly. it. Exactly. Do you get lighter car seats because you have two to carry or you three don't. to carry? You don't. You want to go because right now our car seats are going now to 35 pounds uh -huh. and we're go we hopefully going to be able to keep them a little longer. We don't. We go for safety. Okay. So still on the safety so issue. It also depends. Car seats are really interesting when you have double car seats in the car. Often with multiples, people are a little panicked. And so they want to put an adult in the middle of the car seats. Can an adult still buckle up when there are two large infant car seats with bases on in the car? On either side of them? Yes. Yeah. So you've got to kind of see your car and your car rating and see whether that car seat will fit into that car safely mm -hmm. on either side. That makes sense. Yeah. And if you just if you have the heavier one, then you just go to the chiropractor more often. That's there fine. we go. <laughs> okay. A plug for me. Uh, okay, so in addition to car seats so and after a snap car and go, seats and snap and go, then it's going to be where are we placing the babies? Where in, in will the they be sleeping? Okay. So is it going to be as I said, two bassinets, which is temporary, because once they reach fourteen pounds, they're out of that. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be using their Can cribs? they not go in the same bassinet? No. Weight-wise, they cannot do as well as for if they move, there's just not big enough space in a bassinet. Okay, so it's there's either two bassin two, one bassinet per child. Correct. Or alternatively, two pack and plays, mm -hmm. one crib and one Is it the same thing? They can't both play. go in one pack and play? So there is a twin pack and play. I just think it's so short-lived just to buy that. It's not worth the money. Oh, I forgot the name of it, but I did see one with like a little wall even between them. Yeah, but it's it's a great coat. But the truth of the matter is it doesn't last very long. The mm -hmm. Babies move. We want them to move. Uh -huh. We want them to have some kind of space. Why would so, you do one crib and one pack and play? Just if you don't want to spend the purchase, the money. And I don't know what sizes of rooms are. Uh -huh. you know, all of a sudden, to put two cribs in a room is a lot of crib. Uh -huh. You need to have but that space. But cribs are big. Could you put two kids in one crib? So, you really have to go on the American Academy of Pediatrics uh -huh. and read their latest request saying no. Oh, they don't want it. They don't want it any longer. Because and they get on top of exactly. each other? Exactly. Oh. However, until five years ago, it was the absolute number one way of sleeping multiples. Yeah, we had triplets, a friend who had triplets, Absol and they were all in the all crib. All in the crib. And, and, you know, they do so well. With feeding off each other, sounds, smells, breathing, all of it. That's how so, they are in, in the womb. In utero. So yeah. if you a... said to me, Sue, would you do it? I did it. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful experience. We start off in a crib. They lie side by side. When they start moving, then I put head uh, toe to toe. Mm -hmm. And then eventually when they were really moving and grooving, then they moved into the own cribs. Mm -hmm. But I do like that, but I do have to follow the American Academy of Pediatrics. But when they're together, do they end up on the same sleep schedule? You create a sleep schedule. For, for your, both of them. For multiple. When one baby, baby A wakes, mm -hmm. you wake baby B. Oh, wow. 
You have to. Otherwise, remember, you probably have forgotten how long it takes to nurse or feed a newborn. Oh, well, let's talk about that. Is that the next logical thing? Uh, for somebody who wants to nurse or breastfeed their kids, uh, and they, let's start with twins, right? So how, how do you go about setting up a plan for breastfeeding twins? Do you make enough milk for twins? 100% if you're blessed, if you're lucky enough, but usually you are. But just Ask like singleton. Sometimes. For help. Yeah. Don't think you're going to be able to tackle this by yourself. Okay. Get a lactation specialist in there. Get her as many times as you want. The good news with Obamacare is that we are all entitled to lactation specialists. Oh. They don't want to give you formula in the hospital, so they naturally will want you to nurse. So make sure when you check into the hospital, please make an appointment prior to the baby's even being born for the lactation specialist to come and see you ASAP. Mm -hmm. So you want to get that help immediately. Yes, it is totally doable. In the beginning, they might tell you to nurse one at a time, so baby A will go on to the side A, your okay. breast, one side breast, and baby after that one, once we've burped and fed, which remember is 45 minutes, right. you give baby some, daddy the baby, <laughs> and then you start with baby B, uh -huh. and then you do it. Then Just right away, back to back? Back to back, because we want to be feeding at the same time. A feeding... With multiples in the beginning is a one and a half hours. Baby A gets 45 For each minutes. Feeding. Yep. And they eat 10 times a day. And or... then remember an hour and a half later because every three hours we are going to be eating. Mm. So you have to do it because the only way we're going to be able to get our multiples to stretch is to get enough calories, enough breast milk or formula into their bodies between 6 a.m. And midnight, mm -hmm. we have to fill the little bellies so we can get some kind of stretch. What's the benefit of that as opposed to feeding both babies, one on each side? You tried in the beginning. Remember how hard it is to beginning to learn how to breastfeed? Oh, so you're saying once you get the technique down. Once you get the technique, then you can do football holds. There's ways to do it. You can put their legs overlapping each other. There's many, many ways. Sometimes the lactation specialist will tell you to pump for one baby, so somebody can bottle feed that baby the breast milk, and you'll nurse the one baby mm -hmm. at the same time, and then the next feeding, you'll switch it off. When you said nurse baby A on side A, they don't switch in the middle? You don't do that because you've got you to keep to your- You have to save side B no, for exactly. baby B. Exactly. You don't okay. want your letdown to happen in side B, and baby B hasn't eaten Nothing it. to eat. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's doable, 100%, but you've got to know it's a lot of work. But it's, you know, it's the whole thing of learning how to cope with it all. And if you're not going to stress yourself out and say, okay, if it doesn't happen in a week, I'm not going to do it. Don't put a time on it. Just relax, drink, and ask for those lactation specialists to come in all the time, and you'll get a hang of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds like, it, aside from from the uniqueness, it sounds like it's a similar overall as with one baby where you, if you work at it, it tends to work and sometimes it doesn't work and then you realize it's not working and you either supplement with formula or switch exactly. to formula. Exactly. The other, only other issue that we do tend to see with multiples is the prematurity. Mm -hmm. Making that they delivered so early sometimes, that does impact the nursing making it a lot harder for babies to latch on, babies to get the hang of it, to suck proficiently, that makes it a little bit more tricky. And there's more of them. Exactly. Oh. So sometimes that's difficult. What are what are common mistakes that people make or regrets that they have with multiples and until they realize that there is a better way to do it? Well, I think the most important thing you can ever tell a multiple parent is never tell them who's older. Never tell them who's older. Yeah. Multiples are born at the same time. Uh -huh. If it's a C-section, it's... Oh, don't tell the kids who's older. Absolutely. Oh, I don't know why we live in a society. That's Everybody the first question. Everybody always wants to know who's the oldest. Uh -huh. Really, does it make any difference? No, but let me tell you, every grandparent is going to tell you, oh, he's my oldest grandchild. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that he's creates a little complex one. for the one that's 35 seconds younger? Exactly. <laughs> They're always the younger child. Although there's sometimes twins that are born a few months apart. Yeah, but that's not very often. And that's It's pretty rare. <laughs> pretty rare. Yeah. So don't tell them who they who's older. And then 
be very careful not to label them because everybody is going to label them. So for the parents that are now expecting multiples after a singleton, make sure that you don't call them the twins, the same way as you don't want to call them the babies because your older one is going to want to become the baby or the twin. Mm -hmm. Give them their names immediately. Um, If it's your first ones, remember to also call them by their names, not the twins. And for the parents that never had that singleton, you cannot imagine how many pictures you took of your babies when they were just one baby. Mm -hmm. And when your parents all of a sudden have multiples, you take all the pictures with them together. Don't. Take some pictures of them alone. They were individual children. And you have to buy a single stroller for multiples. You need to be able to take them out as singletons. They need to form that bond with a parent. Their first bond is with each other and then only with parents. So we need them to learn that relationship with a mom and a dad. So get them out as separates. So you would buy a single stroller and a double stroller or two single strollers and a double stroller? I would buy a double stroller because you're not going to do single strollers that often. And a single stroller can be a cheap umbrella stroller. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. So your, you, your solid stroller is a double. A double. It's going to start off with being a snap and go. And then you're going to purchase a double stroller, which I definitely prefer the side by side. Nobody ever wants to be in the back of the stroller. <laughs> they always want to be in the front. And then it's just always fighting. Yeah. There's plenty of other stuff to fight about. Yep. <laughs> um, are there other gear considerations? First of all, do you, can you wear twins at the same time? There is a double wrap that you can purchase. Remember, though, we want them to grow quickly. They become very heavy quickly. Uh-huh. So much easier just to wear one at a time. And it's a great way to wear one and push one. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, yeah. That makes it a lot easier. So you could always do that. I'm not such a fan of doing the double, wrap, um, holding them both, wearing them both. It's just very heavy. Mm-hmm. So after that, then we're going to purchase swings. Ooh. I'm a very, very big swing person. I love movement for babies. I love the way that it develops their baby's brains. The back of the brain, um, at the very back of the nape of the neck, is where this brain increases all the time with movement. And one way to do it is to put them in a swing. So when they go in a swing and you're walking around the kitchen and grabbing that coffee to just make sure that you can actually stay awake and they're watching all this action, but they're going back and forth, their brain is just growing and growing by all this action. So you'll say, I always say, as soon as they're able to sit, you've got to get them to the park. You put them into one swing, back to back in a bucket swing. And they watch all these little children going up slides, down slides, around, running. Their brain is just taking this all in. Hmm. That's how we're going to get brilliant little babies. Oh, wow. Two in the same swing. So swings are very important. Um, And obviously you're bathing them separately. You only need one changing table. Wait, wait. Why do you bathe them separately? In the beginning, you have to bathe them oh, When they're very tiny. Yes. But at some point, they As get... soon as they sit, yeah. 100% by the infant car, uh, bath seats, mm-hmm. for sure, put them in the bathtub together. It is so much fun for I them. I imagine, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Good Kids love to bath together. It's a big activity during the day. But they need to be sitting independently. So when they're really little, you're, you're sometimes you're, you're saying you, you feed them for 45 minutes, One, then 45 minutes, the other one. When bath time happens, it's two separate baths. Sometimes they take baths on every alternate night. Oh, wow. That's a big commitment. It's a a huge job. That's why there's maternity leave or paternity leave for that reason, to get the rhythm going. Mm -hmm. And I always say, give yourself six weeks. Don't think it's going to fall into place before then. It takes time to get the whole rhythm, the nursing, the feeding, the naps. It takes time. Six weeks until you come out of that whole fog and you're like, okay, I'm going to be able to do this. When they get a little bit older, how do you handle them reaching different milestones at different – the same milestones at different times? You tell your spouse, partner, 
at, when it's very dark and the door's closed, are you worried about baby A that they haven't done that? Mm-hmm. Are you worried about baby <laughs> B that they haven't done that? You never, ever do that comparison. The reason is, is that we tend to be a society that looks at large motor skills. Mm-hmm. That's how we judge advanced children. If they're walking early, crawling first, we don't look at those children that are tracking early. We don't look at those children that are starting to say sounds as early. We know that the brain can't work in all those areas at the same time. So if your child is walking early, I promise you baby B is probably talking up a storm and you haven't even realized that part of the brain has moved forward. Mm -hmm. You can't do comparisons. Everybody else will. And then the next part they'll do is they'll put a label onto them. Oh, she's the talkative one. Oh, she's the agile one. She must not be at all coordinated. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I mean, that happens uh, probably even with singles, more than one singleton in the house. um, All the time. Even though they're a couple of years apart or so. Uh, When (laughs) when one... One baby stops nursing, does it mean the second baby has to stop nursing? No, because it's it's prefer- preference. Some babies lose interest. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever had any of your babies that lost the interest. Mm-hmm. Some babies begin to teethe and mommy decides, you know what, I don't want to be a teething toy and they just don't get the hang of it. Some babies never, ever drink enough nursing and so they don't don't ever feel full enough. So that baby will go on formula and you'll just nurse one. Mm-hmm. So no. So they're they're completely they're like siblings that just happen to be the same age. Yes. <laughs> right. I yes. mean that's what it sounds like. They just do different things at different times, and and you just have two. Correct. Or three. Or three. Or four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know it strikes me like this. It always is interesting when someone does IVF and then they they have a baby but freeze some embryos, and then. A year or two later, they have another baby. Those babies were created at the same, same time. time. So yeah. they're like they're like twins that were born exactly. two years apart. Yeah. Um, okay. Other things, as they get a little bit older, towards the end of that first year. So, you know, I laugh is that, don't ask me how they get this, but all children are very possessive of, t- of uh, wheels. So there are a few things we can never share. Okay. Number one is they each need their own little cozy coupe, little tykes car. Uh You have to, the number one selling car in America. (laughs) Um, They each need their own bicycle Uh or tricycle, and you can never ask them to share it. Interesting. It's something that they want possession of, the same way as you probably don't want to give me your car. Right. I don't mind. Oh, okay. But but I was never like that. But it's it's in our family – with singletons again, every, every kid has toys that are theirs that they keep in their own toy box, and the rest are family toys. Love it. So uh, it makes sense that you're saying this in retrospect that things with wheels are more likely they they right. want that in their own. I also toy box. say that when you move them into beds eventually, when and we know I, I just want to tell you a little side notes because everybody's going to start shaking right now. <laughs> Multiples jump out of cribs are way quicker than a singleton oh, really? does. Why? Because baby A jumps into baby B's crib much <laughs> earlier and says, I'll give you a leg over. I'll show you how. Let's go. <laughs> so, so they have a partner in crime. Absolutely. So um, I always say when you put them into beds, make sure you always buy two end tables. They each need an end table with drawers and closets that they can put all their collections in. Mm-hmm. And they need permission from their brother or sister when they want to play with each other's toys. Yeah. Those are their possessions. And they're very, very proud of them. Even if it's every single rock in the park that you've had to collect, mm-hmm. every dry leaf, whatever yeah. it is, you've got to respect their belongings. Sure. That's good advice. Um, okay. <clears throat> when uh, When multiples get a little bit bigger... Uh, you talked earlier about how they have their each unique identities. Even if they're identical twins, they have their their own identities. Um, I know with our kids, we do alone night. So at least once a year, we will take out each kid. They get to pick where they want to go and what they want to do, and it's just us spending time with them. Um, and then as the year goes on, so sometimes I'll take the boys and do something. My wife will take the girls and do something on the same night. So we have guy time and girl time. And then we'll take the older kids together and do something that they're up to in their skill level and the younger kids at their skill level. Um, but it seems more chaotic and harder, but maybe even more necessary when you have oh, multiples. But remember, 
your multiples can just go to the dry cleaners with you, one. Mm-hmm. One can just go to Ralph's with you. One can just go to Starbucks with you. You don't always have to do those special things. It's just that one-on-one, going mm-hmm. to the library, going for a walk, just having that time as well as story time. I'm a big believer in trying to do separate story time when you can. Hmm, interesting. That they can both cuddle into, that one can cuddle into your arm and find that alone time and say, you know what happened at school today? You know, Johnny didn't want to share his snack with me. That's when you get it on those little quiet alone times, not when it's chaotic with everybody being there. Yeah. It's, it seems like you have to work much harder to give them each individuality. Yeah. But can I tell you what multiples do? They read off each other. So there is going to be one all the time that's needier, needs mommy more, daddy more, anybody around more, whoever's helping, whatever it is. And baby B will sit back and watch it. And then all of a sudden you're like flip flop and then it totally changes. And baby B's like, my turn, you sit back. And that's why you have to let go of this guilt of the one that's demanding all the time, the one you're picking up all the time, the one that is always ahead of everything. You've got to say, it's okay. I will get to the other one. When that one needs it, I will get to it. Mm -hmm. And it really does. They read the situation so brilliantly. I really do feel that they know when each other needs their time. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. I um, I always felt like the hardest transition for us and for a lot of other parents that I work with is when they have a single baby is not the hardest. It's when they have their second child and they have to learn how to juggle two needy customers at the same time. Uh, but uh, with multiples, you have to do that from day one. Yeah. And especially if, listen, if it's your first ones, as I said in the beginning, ignorance is bliss. You don't know any difference. Mm-hmm. But a lot go from one to three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's difficult. I see that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, one to three. Right, one to two is challenging. One to yeah. three must be even more so. Um, well, our time went really quickly. Do you have any final tips for someone who is expecting or just recently had multiples? Help. Get help. Ask for help. Ask grandparents. Ask aunts. Ask people. People, you need hands. Ask for the help. People will help you if you ask them. Somebody can come and just dr- do your laundry for you. Somebody can just come and cook a meal for you. Get help. That will help you. You mentioned that six weeks is as a like hang in there for six weeks. Um, but then are there other markers where things get dramatically easier? Well, you know, six weeks you've got your rhythm going. Mm-hmm. Okay. Then obviously it gets much easier when they sleep through the night because you kind of feel alive again. So that sleep is such – that to me is once that happens, life does come to become much better. Obviously, the next horrible part is when we have time change, the winter one being much harder for multi, for babies anyway. In general, It yeah. gets dark so early. It's like that's always a hard one. Sunday, whenever we're about to have the next time change, will be so wonderful because um, – Babies do so well when we have the longer days. and There's more daylight. Yeah. So, you know, it's just a matter of just finding each one of those. Nursery school is when you get a little bit easier for multiples. Why? When everybody's having separation anxiety peaking at two and three quarters, you all of a sudden have it easier. They're going to school together. Together. So there is those times that you get that little bit of a break. I have heard that from parents of twins that – you know, with one, you're the sole source of their entertainment, exactly. but with two, they have each other to, yeah. to keep each other entertained. Absolutely. So as and long the as trick not, is uh, for you not to become a referee. Right. You How do you need do that? To le- well, you've got to let them sort out you're the issues. You're wearing the referee, Chloe. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> they need to make sure that you let them sort it out. We don't let them hit, bite, and all of that. But let them sort out the issues. They'll do a fine job. And the other thing we know about multiples is they recover much quickly. They don't bear grudges against their siblings. Mm. They don't. They get on. Okay, we'll be, we're still twins. Oh, well, let's just keep doing it. <laughs> uh, wonderful advice. Thank you so much. Sue, where can we find you online? Um, babiesfirstclass.com. Babiesfirstclass.com. Thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your uh, expertise. And at home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. If you have a topic you'd like us to discuss, send your suggestions to info at informedpregnancy.com and visit us online for lots more pregnancy and parenting media at informedpregnancy.com. I 
I got a whole lot of questions for you. This kid's gonna test my will. I got a lot to learn and my babies do.